right from Thursday night into, into Sunday morning this morning. We had such an amazing time in prayer on Thursday night. It was uh, God taking us to a different level. He's doing some, we knew this summer was going to be um, consecration, holiness, set himself apart uh, for what he wants to do the coming seasons that are to come. So we knew that this is our training, kind of our training time, our training field. So it was very interesting. We knew a couple of weeks ago that God was going to begin to transition in our prayers on Thursday nights. We've been, we've been probably for the last few years really focusing on our kingly duties, declaration, proclamation, standing in the gap. And now God's really moving us more into this summer, we feel like, in more of our priestly duties. So knowing that and for in order us for be successful, be powerful in authority with our kingly duties, our priestly duties have to be in order. So um, a few, few weeks ago, I think uh, Matt and I and Sako had lunch and we were talking about tag teaming over the summer, kind of doing some, seeing how the Holy Spirit leads and it's amazing how it flows right into one another. Three weeks ago, I started a little bit on uh, altars of prayer and how important it is in our kingly duties, how we need to maintain the altars of prayer. And knowing that in the season that we're coming in, prayer is gonna be our most vital tool that we have to use against the enemy. This is why he fights it so hard. This is why it's hard for you to get into it. This is why the church doesn't talk about it much anymore because the enemy likes that because he knows this is our most powerful tool that we have to use is our prayer and how we offer up to God and then the answers that come back and then us standing in the gap. So I'm going to recap just a little bit um, from last time just for those maybe that weren't here and to refresh our memories. So if I got my page. There we go. So um, an altar is a place where praises and prayers are rendered unto God. It symbolizes holiness and represents the presence of God. A higher place where untarnished, spotless, blameless services are offered to God. It's a place of encounter. It's a place where the spirit realm meets the natural realm where humanity meets divinity. And it's, it's so important that we have to change our perspective on what prayer is. Because most people, if you talk to anybody, that not even people who have been in the church line, prayer is for the old lady back in the corner that doesn't have anything else to do. We'll let her do it. We'll let, you know, we'll let the people that have a small team do it. But prayer is for each and every one of us. And it's very important that you develop a healthy prayer life. In 1 Peter 2 and 5, and I'm old school, Matt always asks me if I want slides, and I never do, and I like to read out of my Bible. I do write some scriptures on there, but I like to read from the Bible so that you can follow along too. Hopefully, I really encourage all the younger ones, get a Bible. You never know when the electronic stuff may go down. All right, in 2 Peter 2, and we're going to read verse 5. And it says, And God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah. Oh, wait a minute. I'm in the wrong place. It's 1 Peter. Yep, it's 1 Peter 5. Sorry. 1 Peter 2, verse 5. There we got it. All right. And you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priest. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As the scriptures say, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem, chosen for great honor, and anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. So there we're seeing where God is talking about that what he, what he wants as our priestly duties, that he is building us into the temple of God. And we're going to get into that a little bit more. And then verse 9 he says, but you are not like that. He's talking about the people that stumble in the verses before. For you are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. So we see that God is saying that after Jesus died, that we are to move into a different uh, dimension of prayer. We're to move into the dimension of setting up altars in our life. I was, we were talking about it before of how important it is that you have a consistent 
time, whether it's the same time every week or every day or whatever it is, but a consistent um, schedule where you're making time to pray, where you're making time to be with the Lord, where you're making sure that you're fulfilling your priestly duties. Because everything else flows. When you get this out of alignment, this doesn't work. Right. Nothing out here works. So the priest, well, we're going to talk about the duties of the priest a little bit. The priest is called to maintain the altar and the fire in order for it to be potent. There must be consistency. If anybody here has ever built a fire, you have a fireplace, you have a fire pit, you did a bonfire. If you don't put the logs on the fire, it goes out. So it's our job to make sure that we maintain our altars. And our, and our altars are our prayer times, are the times that we're spending with God. Remember, um, some of you weren't here, but in the first time that I taught, we talked about um, the two altars that Abram built. And they were in Genesis 12, 8. And the first one was a memorial to God because it was about his encounter with God. So he built this memorial to remember his encounter with God, where God told him he was going to give him the land and all the things God said he was going to do through him. So the first altar that Abram built was initiated by God because of God came and encountered Abram. And uh, if you've ever had an encounter with God and you do not build a memorial around that, that encounter, you'll lose it. So it's important that you keep your encounters with God. Keep a record, right? Have a prayer journal. Write down the things. Record when people give you a word, give you something. Make sure you keep that as a memorial that you can go back in the times because God normally gives us something for what's ahead. It's hardly ever, very rarely, I mean, sometimes it's for now. But a lot of times it's for because two weeks down the road you're going to be like, now I know why I got that. I know why he gave me that so I can walk through this. But the second altar that Abram built was initiated by Abram. This is where Abram called on the Lord. He set up an altar and worshipped and prayed to God. Now, do you, I don't know if you guys remember, some of you were not here, but in the first time I was talking about that when you set up a prayer altar in your home, when you set up a prayer altar, a time that you're going to be with God, what you're doing, you are setting up coordinates in the spiritual realm. And those coordinates can be seen by all of the entities in the spirit realm, right? So you're going to have the enemies, the demonic, that will try to come against to keep you from praying, distractions, uh, things, you know, coming up, you're tired, something happened, your car, all things. He'll try anything he can to keep us from doing that. Yeah. So you realize that you've set up, you've set up a, a, a uh, coordinates in the spiritual realm that also the angels see. And the significance of that, I want to I talk about the one that Abram set up. And we're going to go to Genesis 28, verse 10. So I want you to realize that this is probably, I tried to figure it out, but it was very hard with all of the years of who lived and how long they lived and all of that. But it was somewhere between 145 to 170 years after Abram set up the altar that this encounter happens with Jacob. Jacob did not even know that Abram had set up this altar. So you have to realize there are times in our life when our covenant is calling us to a place that we have no clue that it's calling us. Sometimes it calls you to a church. Sometimes it calls you to a group of people. Sometimes it calls you in your family to do certain things. But your covenant is calling you. And it was calling Jacob, and he didn't even know it. So in, this, uh, in verse 10, it said, Meanwhile, Jacob left Beersheba and traveled toward Haran. At sundown, he arrived at a good place. He set up camp and stopped there in the night. For the night, Jacob found a stone to rest his head against and lay down to sleep. As he slept, he dreamed of a stairway that reached from the earth up to heaven. And he saw the angels of God going up and down on the stairway. At the top of the stairway stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather, Abraham, and the God of your father, Isaac. The ground you are lying on belongs to you. I am giving it to you and your descendants. Your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth. They will spread out in all directions in the west and in the east and to the north and south. And all the families of the earth will be blessed through you and your descendants. What's more, I am with you. I will protect you wherever you go. 
One day I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have finished giving you everything I have promised you. Then Jacob, Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. I wasn't even aware of it. But he was also afraid and said, What an awesome place this is. It is none other than the house of God, the very gateway to heaven. And then a little bit further down it says, He named that place Bethel, which means house of God, although it was previously called Luz. So I want you to see that when Abraham set up that altar, he opened up a portal, a stairway into heaven that would not be closed and cannot be closed unless someone with authority on our side closes it. The, de the demonic cannot close the portals that we open up. But I also want you to realize, I want you to see that the stairway was from earth to heaven. It was set up on earth and it extended into heaven. So in the same manner, the enemy does the same thing with a stairway to hell. And so we have to be conscious of the altars that are set up in our territories and the places where we live that we need to take authority over and that our altars need to burn hotter. They need to outweigh the altars of the enemy. Because I'm, I'm sorry to say that probably over the last 20 years, the church does not talk about the spirit realm. They do not talk about demons. They do not talk about anything. They might mention angels, but very rarely. But when people go and they're hungry and they're looking for something and they go seeking, the enemy opens the spirit realm up like that because we're made to dwell there. Right. We're made in God's image. We're made to be able to live on the earth and in heaven at the same time. Two dimensions at once. Jesus did it and we are supposed to be doing it. <clears throat> Another thing I want you to notice on this where the angels were going up and then down. They were ascending up and then down. They were ascending up, I believe, with the prayers, and then they're coming back down with the answers. They're there to minister to us. When we set up altars, they're there to minister us, to answer the prayers, and we are, we are in charge of that, that uh, portal. We're in charge of making sure that there are no interruptions in what God is wanting to do through that portal. Also, this represents how God um, honors his covenant with us. We need to stand on the covenant that we have. When you become born again, you have a covenant with God. You have a right to go to the throne room. You have a right to, for your family. You have a right for your territories, your, our schools, for our, for our government, for the things that are all around us. We have a right because we have a covenant with God to stand and put him in remembrance that he made a covenant with our forefathers. We have to realize sometimes in our bloodlines there may have been covenants made that we are not aware of that happened. And so this is why it's very important that you maintain your altar and you maintain your, your, your relationship with God to reveal to you anything that could be hindering your flow to the heavenly realm. Now I want us to go to John 1, 50, uh, for John 1 51. I found this very interesting, which... So in this scripture, Jesus was talking about when he, when he was, uh, Nathaniel came to Jesus and, uh, and um, he, told, he told Nathaniel that he saw him under the fig tree and Nathaniel was like, oh my gosh, this has got to be the son of God. But then Jesus says, I tell you the truth, you will see heaven open and the angels of God going up and down on the son of man, the one who is the stairway between heaven and earth. So Jesus was quoting what was going on back in Genesis because he has now opened up the stairway for us to be able to open up stairways in our prayer rooms, in our altars, in our homes, wherever we are establishing an altar. He was showing us what, it is, what was to take place as the house of God. And in John 2.19, Jesus calls himself the temple which we know now that um, we are the house of God, right? In 2 Corinthians, let's look at 2 Corinthians 6. 
6.16. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. It says, so, so we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view, how differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself with, through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconcil uh, reconciling people. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them, and he gave us a wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are now Christ's ambassadors, making his appeal through us that we speak for Christ uh, for others to come back to God. So when we open up our portals, when we open up our, the places of our, our prayer altars, we have a right because we are his ambassadors to do what he has called us to do. <coughs> Sorry. I think um, not only do we have the right, I think we have the obligation. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. I agree. I think sometimes that we uh, take the word of God and we take it as a suggestion when actually it's something that God has told us that we have to do. And, we, and he does that because he has set boundaries for us. And if we live within our boundaries and we do as he's told, then we have the protection of him. Hallelujah. And then in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? So uh, in Matthew 7, 7, I want us to take, start now kind of starting to recognize as a temple of God, what are our duties, right? If we are the priests of our own temple, then we have priestly duties to maintain the temple, in Matthew 7, 7, Jesus says, uh, you'll probably all remember, ask and it will be given unto you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. So what I want us to do now, I want us to tie prayer with how we are a temple, how prayer and the temple, how we work together with prayer and the temple. So I want you to realize that when the temple was set up in the Old Testament, there was the outer court, the inner court, and the Holy of Holies. And we are designed in the same way. Our flesh is the outer court. This is the place where we do our asking. This is the outer court was where the brazen altar was. The brazen altar was where the sacrifice for sin, transfers, uh, trespass, burnt offerings, thanks, reconciliation, and forgiveness were made. This is where we ask for forgiveness. This is when we become born again. We start in the outer court. We accept the sacrifice that Jude made for us. They accepted the sacrifices that were done in the outer court as the forgiveness of their sins. Sadly enough, some people stop there. They never enter into this, to the inner court or the Holy of Holies because they've not been taught or they don't understand. And I heard a message about a week ago that really resonated with me. And he was saying that, you know, it's very important where you're born again because the, the, the way God set up the laws was that we would reproduce after our own kind, right? So if you're born again in a um, lukewarm uh, atmosphere, then to you that's normal. And you never advance above that because you feel like this is, this is normal. This is the way it's supposed to be. If there's not any talk of the Holy Spirit, if there's not talk of the gifts of the Spirit, if all of these things are not introduced to you, you remain at this plateau because this is where you were born again. The inner court was where the golden altar of incense was, the table of showbread, and the golden candlesticks. This is where we seek God. 
This is our sanctified spirit. This is where we receive righteousness, the gift from God that makes us right standing with God. The only ones allowed to enter into the inner court were worshipers, priests, and Jews who were pure. Romans 12, 1, 2 tells us that we are to present our bodies to God as a living and holy sacrifice. The kind, this is interesting because a lot of people will stop before there, the kind that is acceptable to him. So that means there is a kind that's not acceptable. So for us to move into the inner court, we must be worshipers, we must be priests, and we must be pure. In order for our prayers to be effective and acceptable to God. If we go to God in prayer and our temples have been defiled, we will be offering strange fire up to him because we are out of order with what his word says. And strange fire is, it's funny because I had never heard of it before. And a few months ago when the Lord had spoke to me about altars, of prayers of altars and a new dimension of prayer, I woke up in the middle of the night one night and that was it, strange fires. And I was like, oh, I don't know what that means. So, but then I heard Luna say it several times after that. So I was like, she's read that scripture. <laughs> it was funny. So I read the story. So we're going to talk about the story for a minute. It's in Leviticus 10. 1 through 3, and it's a story where Aaron's sons had uh, went into the temple because if you don't know, all of um, Aaron was Moses' brother, and he was, God had put him in charge of the temple, all of the artifacts of uh, all of the priests and all of the things. So Aaron's sons had went into the temple, and they decided they were going to uh, get the altar of incense. They were going to get the incense, and they were going to burn it before God. And when they lit it, they put coals of fire on it, put incense on it. And when they lit it, it was not good in God's nostrils. And they were killed like that. They were burned. The fire came out and consumed them. So we have to know that the, in, in this case, the fire was considered profane because it was, it was prepared by using their own kindling instead of the holy incense from the altar. Serving God and offering strange fire seem very much alike, and yet they are worlds apart. True service is initiated by God. It is when man serves under God's authority, he is hereby accepted. Strange fire originates solely from man. It does not require knowing the will of God or obeying the authority of God. And I think we're seeing a lot of that now today coming out in some of the church situations and things that were raised up that were not of God. A church can grow, if you want to say grow, by a number of people, but a lot of people are just moving from one church to another church because they're unhappy. It's not like they're all being born again. And then some of them, I feel like they, you know, they, they don't even know what it is. I mean, it's more of a community. It's more of a country club. It's more of a fun time than it is a place where you go to learn and worship. And, and you know, we're in, we're in a training here on the earth, and that's for the afterlife. That's for when we get into the millennium. Um, they took what God had set in place as holy and made it, in, made it ordinary. They watched their father do it and thought they could do the same thing without the anointing of God on them to do it. And God was not pleased. God has an order and a way of doing things, and the church simply ignores what the Bible says. A lot, just because a place has the name church above it does not mean that God has ordained that place. If they are ignoring what the Bible says and what, what they are supposed to be doing as the body of believers, then that's not a house of God. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he is the same God in the New Testament as he was in the Old Testament. There is no fear of God anymore. But the truth is we actually have a higher calling under the New Covenant than under the Old Covenant. You'll hear people make the argument of, oh, well, you talk about being holy, that's legalism. Or you talk about, you know, that you shouldn't do this or you shouldn't do that. Not because I, I don't feel like people don't realize that there's a difference between morality and holiness. There are people in the world that are probably more moral than some people in the church. But morality is something that you do from outward in. Holiness is from inward out. Good. And um, 
under the new covenant, under grace, because it's been taught over the last 20 years that everything's okay because we have grace. You can do what you want, it's okay. But under the new covenant, it actually is, is a lot stricter because Jesus said that if a man looks at a woman with lust in his heart, he's already committed adultery. In the Old Testament, they had to actually commit the act before they were found guilty of adultery. So we have to stop and look because we have, because God has given us more and higher standards, he expects more from us as the church. It's all, it's, uh, it's okay and all we have to do is ask for forgiveness, which is a partial truth. It is true. If we ask for forgiveness, God is faithful and just. He hears us. He will answer. He will forgive us. But what's not put in there is the repentance part. Repentance and forgiveness are different. Repentance is where we, we know I should not be doing that and I'm going to turn away from it. Otherwise, you're just doing forgiveness so you can go do it again. And being set free by Jesus is not the length of time between our, the th our sin cycles. It's being totally eradicated from us so that we're walking in the freedom that he provided for us on the cross. In 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, it says, But you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy. I am holy. And Peter was quoting from Leviticus 20 at that point. But he was telling the people there, so if God is telling us that we must be holy, then he's provided a way for us to be holy. He does not tell us to do something unless, we're, unless he's made a way for us to do it. That's how good he is. He doesn't expect us to work it out on our own. He doesn't expect us to try and do it on our own because that's dead works. He's like, I'm telling you this because I've made a way for you to be holy. So can we take all the scriptures, the whole counsel of God, or are we only going to take the ones that make us feel good? Because if we want to just take the scriptures that make us feel good, then you may be standing before God on judgment day and he may say, depart from me, I never knew you. And I don't want that. I want the Holy Spirit to check me every day. I want my temple to be uh, purified. I want my temple to be an offering for God that he lives in that and that he is able to move through it in the way that he wants to. I don't want to stand before God one day and be shocked. I want him to shock me now. Shock me now, God. Get down to the core of it and tell me the deep, dirty, whatever it is. Because I guarantee you, every one of us in here has been defiled in certain ways by association, by things we watch, by things we, by things we do, places we go. You take the temple of God into places that the Holy Spirit is not happy about. And when you grieve the Holy Spirit, he retreats. So if you think I'm not hearing from the Holy Spirit, then you need to go back to the last time you heard from him and say, okay, did I disobey you? Have I done something? I went and spent the night with my son and watched, we watched a movie. And it wasn't, it wasn't bad sexually. It was a Jason State movie, so it was all this fighting kung fu stuff. But they said the F word, every other word. And I left there and I was like, I was so grieved in my spirit. I said, God, forgive me for defiling my temple. And I know that was not pleasing to you. And I don't want that in my life. I want to be where I can stand before God with a pure heart and clean hands, that I, can, that I can go up the mountain of the Lord to find out what we need to do. Because we have people dying around us all, around us, everywhere. And if we're not the ones, then who's going to do it? He's calling for a people that is going to be open to him and say, yes, Lord. That's what we had on Thursday night. The Lord, over and over, we had probably, I don't know, 20 minutes or more, it was, we were just saying, yes, Lord, whatever, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. And then he rose up and he said, no surrender, no retreat. If we're to be the army of God, we can have no surrender, no retreat, no plan B for what he's calling us to do. We have to be willing to go and do what he's calling us to do with no other options but yes, Lord, that we're going to take the territory, that we're going to do what you've called us to do. We're going to be the army of God. Holiness is the fruit of your consecration. We can't have one without the other. So when we concentrate, consecrate ourselves, consecrate ourselves, holiness will be the fruit of our consecration to the Lord. 
Righteousness is a free gift that we get at salvation, but holiness is a process of our consecration to God. I don't think the the church today knows the difference. Righteousness is the gift that you give with God. And I heard this analogy, which I thought was really, really good. He said that, you know, when you become born again and you get righteous, then you get a white gown. Let's say a wedding dress. For you guys, it'd be a white suit. (laughs) When you put that dress on, when you put on anything white, you're not just going to go sit anywhere. You're not going to go and wallow in the mud somewhere in this white garment that you've been given. And this is what we do with our righteousness, with what God has given us. We take it and we go out and we do things with it that we're not supposed to do. And it soils our garments and then it makes us in a place to where we're not hearing from God. So for us to move into the holy of the holies, we must go through the process of the outer court and the inner court. First we ask, then we begin seeking. And the more you seek God, the more you want, you begin knocking. And he said, Jesus said, those that knock, the door will be opened. But you have to do the knocking. Nobody can do it for you. You can't outsource your prayer. (laughs) They can. (laughs) Yes, Lord, we're knocking. (laughs) So I, um, the Holy of Holies was the innermost part of the temple and where the very presence of God dwelt. Only the high priest could go in there once a year to make atonement for his sins and the sins of the people. He would burn incense and sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice onto the mercy seat. The veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple was approximately three and a half inches thick barrier that symbolized the holiness of God and the prohibition of access to him. So at that point in time, not anybody could just go in, just the high priest. Now that we have been made priests, and kings, we are able to go into the Holy of the Holies. And the, the burn incense is our prayers. The, in Revelation, it says that, the, uh, that our prayers go up as incense before God and they're put into a gold bowl. And when that bowl is full, he pulls it back onto the earth with fire. So the incense in our part of going into the Holy Holies is our prayers. And then we have the blood of Jesus that covers us, that we sprinkle on the mercy seat, that removes all of the uh, things that would keep us from going. I believe our Holy of Holies is, is our heart. We have to keep our hearts pure. I think that's the place that God wants to sit upon and rule your life, is on the throne of your heart. In Hebrews 10, uh, 19, <clears throat> thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. It says, and so dear brothers and sisters, we can go boldly, we can boldly enter into heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. So we have an opportunity that we can go into the holy of holies. What will it cost you? Everything. Are you willing to count the cost? Because I tell you, it's worth it. Will you make it to heaven without entering? Maybe. And the only reason I say that is because of the the times that we were born into and what we're living into. There is great deception coming on the earth. This is what Jesus said. And if you're not awake enough to see... Everything going around you, there is great deception coming on the earth. I do believe that the church is going to rise up, the the ecclesia, not the church, the ecclesia, the governing body of Jesus. We are going to rise up. We are going to see miracles. But I can tell you, the enemy will be doing miracles also. It's going to be like with Moses when he threw the rod down and there was a snake. They're going to do something. And you have to have been in the Holy of Holies enough to know the difference. You cannot... See, you cannot uh, detect a counterfeit unless you know the real. That's right. That's right. And you have to know the real and you have to know it for yourself. No child can, I know you have young ones, and it's important that you begin to train them 
in their prayer life, in their knowing of them going up into the, into the heavenlies themselves. Yeah. Because you won't be able to do it for them all the time. None of us, even my granddaughter, has to learn on her own. She has to be able to ascend in that place when she's having troubles, when she needs something. She needs to know this is her source and not mom and dad all the time. So that's the only reason I say that, and I know that probably would ruffle some feathers in our church world today, but I don't think I'm like you. I don't want to take a chance. It's not worth it. If you call yourself a believer, if you're going to call yourself a believer, then my goodness, I think you better believe because every word in this book is true. And every word, every prophecy in this book is coming true. You're seeing it every day, and if you don't know it, it's because you don't know the book. Yeah. You're not reading the book. You're not getting in it for yourself. You're not letting the Holy Spirit reveal to you the things that need to be revealed. Because He wants to. He wants to prepare you. He wants to warn you. He wants to tell you. But if, you're, if we're too busy watching Netflix or, or Disney Plus or whatever it is out there, <laughs> Amazon or whatever... You're not, getting, you're not getting the word that you need to get in you so that you can, so that you can um, battle what you need to battle. Yeah. This is where, in the Holy of Holies, is where we get our discernment, where we get wisdom to walk through the dark times. This is where we get energized and renewed. This is where you will find angels ascending and descending on you to bringing you all that heaven has to offer. This is where, as the house of God, the stairway is open, is in our prayer life. You know why everything happened like it did in the book of Acts? They gave themselves to prayer. That's right. It doesn't say that they just prayed casually. They prayed when they felt like it. They prayed, you know, because uh -huh, we'll, we'll pray today and then tomorrow we'll go swimming. <laughs> they gave themselves to prayer because in the day they were living, it meant life or death. It was life or death. They knew that they would not make it if they had not that strength in them to do what God had called them to do. This is the place that he wants us to dwell. This is Psalms 91. This is the secret place of the Most High. Is in the Holy of Holies. Psalms 25, 14 says, there is a private place reserved for the devoted lovers of Yahweh, where they sit near him and receive the revelation secrets of his promises. But it takes an act of our will. It takes, it takes um, you making a decision, choosing to do it, being dedicated to it. It takes, uh, and I guarantee you that everything in the world around you will try to keep you from doing it. And I know everybody's busy. I know there's you know, different levels of where people are. But the Holy Spirit knows each and every one of us so intimately that he knows the very hairs on your head. He knows exactly where you are, and he knows exactly how to get you to where you need to be, but you have to trust him. You have to give him the opportunity. You have to give yourself to prayer and then say, okay, I don't know what I'm doing. And I promise you, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm just letting the Holy Spirit lead me every day. And I'm like, and I feel like if he gives me a word and I have pastors that are awesome enough to share the word, that we can share the word together and share with our family. Because I feel like that if we don't share with one another the revelations and the things, then you're, you're, you're getting a different revelation than I'm getting. And I need that piece of the puzzle and you right. need my piece of the puzzle. That's right. And that's why we all be together. That's why we all work together. That's why he calls us a body fitly joined together. This is where he reveals his heart and his desires to you. Do you want God to talk to you like he did Moses? I do. Yeah. Face, to face. face to face. I do. This is where we move from a servant to a son and a friend. And I understand this so much better now that my daughters are grown. You know, when they're young, you're busy, you're raising them. But when they get old enough to become your friend, it's a whole new revelation a whole different relationship it's it's you don't think it could get any better because you love your kids but then when they become your friend too it's amazing 
It's really amazing. And that's how God feels about us. Not only are we his sons and daughters, but he wants us to be friends. He's looking for those who will answer the call. He's looking for sons and daughters to rise up and grab a hold of his vision. We can't do things like we used to, and we've been saying this for a long time. Let the shaking that's happening around us shake everything that is in us. Let God shake you. Let him prune you. Let him take all of the things that's happened to you, all of the things going on around you, and make something good out of it, because he will. I know uh, it's probably been, I, we were in the other building, and it was, um, I don't know, two and a half years ago or three years ago now. I don't even know. Time goes so fast. But it was a message the Lord gave me on our belief system and how important. And it was funny because Matt taught on this a couple of weeks about our operating system, and that's how God explained it to me. Our belief system is like our operating system. And when it gets a virus or it gets corroded, then you're getting wrong data. And the Lord started me on that journey when I was watching somebody I had watched a lot, and she did something different, and I was like, ooh. And the Holy Spirit said, why do you think that? And I went, I don't know. Why do I think that? Because I trust this person. I've listened to them. They're in the Word. They know that. And so he said, you need to go check. So I began letting the Holy Spirit, okay, why am I believing that? And he started pulling out some things like from my childhood, some things that from messages you heard that you don't go and double check. You should never take a message. You should not take my message and just say, oh, that's good. You should go home and read the scriptures. You should go home and check and make sure that this is in line with what God's saying. And I didn't do that all the time because we get lazy sometimes. And, and you know, I say there's different, you think now, well, why didn't I do that then? But you know, there's different seasons in our life and God releases revelations at different seasons. But now I believe he's opening the book. The book that Daniel shut, I think God is opening it. John saw part of it, and I think we're going to see the rest of it. So let us be like David in Psalms 139. Search me, O God. You know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. The part of that that we don't like to hear is test Test me, O oh God. Because when God tests us, or we go through a test, just like when you were in school, you find out how much you don't know. Pop quizzes, I think COVID was a pop quiz. We found out how much we did not know. That's right. But the next thing that comes is going to be harder than a pop quiz. And this is where the test is going to be. And where will we stand? What side are we going to stand on? You are going to be, you are, if you have not yet in your family somewhere come across the things that are going on in the world today that it has not knocked on your door, it will. It will. Because none of us are exempt from it. And the enemy is going to see how far he can push. But when we are together as the ecclesia and we rise up in the power of God, he cannot, he cannot come against our power. This is what we have to understand. He cannot come against our power. He comes against our consecration. That's why he tries to get you to go to this place. That's why he tries to get you to watch this. That's why he tries to get you to hang out with this person. He's coming against your consecration. Because if he breaks your consecration, then your holiness is not there and your temple is defiled. Um, I think it was probably about two months ago. I was praying and the Lord said, B, like B-E. Right? And that's what I did. I was like, okay, Lord. And he didn't say anything else. And I was like, okay, I usually know, well, I'm going to go. Because you know what he does when he does that? He wants you to go searching. He wants you to start seeking. He wants you to start knocking and asking him, okay, Lord, what are you trying to say? So I looked up the definition of be. And the thing that I found interesting is it's a verb. It means to exist occur or show the characteristics of something. And one of the forms of the, of the verb to be is infinitive, which means it is normally identical in English with the first person singular, so you and I, singular, that performs some functions of a noun and at the same time displays some characteristics of a verb. 
So then he took me to the, when I started studying, he took me to the scripture of be holy. So when God says be holy, he is saying you exist, occur, and show the characteristics of holiness. And as a noun, it means it's who we are and that it's always evolving as a verb. It's an action word. So I want everybody to stand up. I also want to say that as we go into worship for just a little bit, and I want us to begin to ask the, the Holy Spirit, Lord, is there anything in my temple that needs to be cleansed? Is there anything in me, O oh Lord? Search me, O oh Lord, and point out anything in me, Lord, that needs to change, that needs to, to go away. But I want you to realize that a lot of times when the Holy Spirit begins to reveal something to you, some things you can repent of, you can ask forgiveness and go on. Some things you need someone to walk with you. There are times when we go through things, it's important that we confess our sins one to another. But I don't say you do that with just anybody. I say you have a group of people, you are certain people, a small, probably a small group of people you trust intently that you know you can go to them and tell them anything and that they're going to hold you accountable and they're going to hold you um, responsible and they're going to walk with you and help you to walk out whatever it is that the Holy Spirit is wanting you to be delivered from or set free from. There are some things we can do, but there are other things we need the body to do with us. We're not meant to do this alone. Right. We're meant to do this as a tribe. Right. And we are a tribe. And we are the body of Christ. And the Lord told me um, about a month ago, he showed me the scripture where it says that we are the bride of Christ. And he asked me, he said, what does Christ mean? And it means the anointing. The anointed one, the anointing. So we are to be one with the anointing. We are to be like husband and wife with the anointing. And in order to do that, we have to make sure we're walking in alignment with all that God has for us. Hallelujah.